Welcome to the Team Eurage Lotus 25 Cycle Cart Design Overview Series. This is a multi-part summary of the concept select and detailed design phases of the Cycle Cart project. If you're new and this is the first video you've watched, make sure you watch the Team Introduction and the Cycle Cart Project Introduction videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe below. Look us up on Instagram and Facebook at Team Eurich for regular updates. Also, let me know in the comments section below if you want me to elaborate on any of the design topics covered. I've summarized a lot of detail so I can expand if there is enough interest. Righto, what is a cycle cart? Well, cycle karting is an artistic hobby where enthusiasts build and drive small versions of vintage open wheelers. For more information on the history, I've put a link in the comments to a video and a couple of websites with more details on cycle karting. You can see some of the varied and amazing cars that have been produced. I don't want to bore you with stuff that's been done better by others, so let's move on. The team tries to stick to the cycle car foundation guidelines where possible, and we'll try and explain as best as we can along the way. Three, two, one, let's go. Okay, so we'll be covering the following scope. Rules and intent. Layout and architecture. Dynamics. Powertrain. Driver controls. Structures covering chassis and suspension. And finally, the bodywork. The design series will be broken up into three parts. Part one will cover the rules and intent, the layout and architecture, and an explanation on outboard steering geometry. Part two will cover dynamics and powertrain. And part three will cover the driver controls, structures, and bodywork. So we start at the rules and intent. There are very few official rules, more guidelines outlined by the originators to be able to call your vehicle a cycle cart. The basis of design is the Stevenson cart pictured. The cart is to be based on historic single seat open wheelers, pre-war era or anything with spoked wheels. The cart is to be powered by a six and a half horsepower Honda GX200 or clone engine. Transmission is via a TAV2-30 CVT. And only the rear axle can have braking and drive. 17-inch motorcycle rims and tires are to be used. A wheelbase of 66 inches or 1676 mil. A track width of approximately 40 inches or 974 mil. And finally, make it look good, build it yourself and have fun. Straight up, I'm not going to comply with the first item. My inspiration car didn't have spoked wheels and is from 1963. But beyond that, I'm going to keep to these guidelines as it keeps everything light, not overly powerful and fun to drive. Our team's foundation principles are to make things safe, fun and reliable. We will review all choices with respect to these principles and safety always comes first. So why a Lotus 25? We have a real affinity for Lotus Grand Prix cars. When you look at the history of open wheelers, the Lotus name was a pioneer in the late 50s through to the mid 80s until its founder Colin Chapman died. Chapman was an engineer's engineer, always pushing the envelope. From stressed engines, inboard suspension, monocoques, aero, ground effects, you name it, he was into it, including some pretty shady deals. The 25 was the first F1 champion for Lotus and Jim Clark, and it also pioneered the monocoque chassis. Fun fact is that this car is the reason why monocoques are also referred to as tubs, as in bathtubs for their shape. It was also a bit of a cheeky car. Chapman released the Lotus 24 to customers and claimed that the 25 would be mechanically identical, but with different bodywork. That bodywork ended up being an alley monocoque, which was half the weight of the 24 space frame and smashed everything in its path. We love this car. It's great looking, has clean lines, good proportions, and we cannot wait to build a tribute to it. At this point, we start to lay the car out. There are a few key steps to follow. We've already established the rules and restrictions, so we'll move on to benchmarks and simulation, 
car targets, track wheelbase and driver ergonomics, engine position, suspension type, and steering architecture. Given the tight packaging of this car, the engine placement, suspension type, and steering architecture have a large effect on the wider design. Now normally, there would be a heap of simulation performed to benchmark against competitors and theoretical performance. We would also set performance targets and complete the concept selection process, tyres, engines, etc. Now I've developed some simulations for a hill climb formula lever project, which me and my friends have been developing over the last 15 years. But given this is not about pure performance, rather it's about driving and building pleasure, we will skip this step. If there is interest in this, I can do another video on this process. Next, we'll look at some parameters to target. Because we haven't driven one before or completed any simulation, we don't have any real metrics to target. So it's going to be more about setting objectives that achieve a fun build and driving experience. And we think the following targets will achieve this. We want a low center of gravity. There is no number, but we want to keep everything as low as we know these things will be easy to roll. We want low steering effort. We want adjustability in the suspension for tuning and refinement. We want a solid and predictable pedal and steering feel. We want to minimize understeer from the locked rear axle. We want to maintain as much of the 25 look as possible. And finally, utilize as many off the shelf components as is fun and practical. Honestly, I have zero interest in making a steering rack from scratch. Let's start to lay the car out. For a vehicle like this where aesthetics drive the design, we start with getting the scale proportions of the tribute vehicle looking good. Ideally, simulation would drive the track and wheelbase. However, for this, we start by putting the wheels to their maximum position as per the guidelines. 40 inch track, 66 inch wheelbase. As the bodywork basis, we found the Lotus 25 3D model off the interwebs that's used in one of the computer racing games. We then played with the scale of the body to fit the new wheelbase and track width. For the Lotus, the guideline wheelbase was just slightly too short, so we went out about an inch to 1700mm on the wheelbase, which kept the proportions of the base car. The track width remained unchanged from the guidelines. With these principal vehicle dimensions and body sizing locked in, we moved to the driver placement and ergonomics. A few CAD people were developed using 95th percentile man and 5th percentile woman, as well as a jury CAD person to check my own proportions. We wanted a fairly reclined seating position for tall drivers, but the ability to move the pedal box and create custom seats for shorter drivers. We set the basic ergo so that there was a bend in the elbow for leverage on the steering wheel and a bend in the legs so that having either foot off the pedal wasn't uncomfortable. I essentially started from the approximate angles of the 2009 Monash FSAE setup that I had on an old USB stick. A super dodgy ergo rig was then put together to check that the CAD derived driver positions were comfortable. If you look online, there's some fancy pants rigs FSAE and F1 teams make to validate their driver ergonomics. In hindsight, I should have actually spent a bit more time on the rig as I think this might be a bit uncomfortable, but I was just so excited I wanted to move to the detailed design. Next, we look at engine placement. So there are only two practical configurations, mid-engine and rear-engine. We've seen both configurations used on cycle carts and it seems to be driven by the proportions of the inspiration vehicle. We looked at both layouts and each had their own benefits and compromises. So for the rear engine, it does have a shorter wheelbase but a longer overall length, which makes the proportion slightly off. It is easier to access the pull starter. The feet can be behind the front axle line, which allows for tighter front suspension packaging. It does have the trade-off for a higher center of gravity the weight distribution is pushed rearward, which could be an okay thing. And finally, it does have increased your inertia. So it means that this car will be slightly less responsive to turning compared to a mid-engine. So for a mid-engine design, you could have a much more compact rear end packaging. The engine can be packaged a lot lower as well, which results in a lower center of gravity. It does have better access to the driveline and brakes. 
it does have a lower yaw inertia and should have a more balanced weight distribution. It also has better proportioning, longer wheelbase, but shorter overall length. However, it is difficult to access the starter. The feet are in front of the front axle line. It also is a lot more difficult to get the engine out from the roll hoops, and it makes the front suspension packaging a little bit more difficult. We chose the mid-engine design as it packages everything a bit neater, and it's more of a conventional layout. However, it does introduce a few additional complexities in the detailed design. For weight distribution, having more rear bias should be better given drive and braking are on the rear axle only. But at this point, without tyre information, it's just a guess. The rear engine configuration can be optimised, but we don't feel that it's in keeping with the look of the 25. Next, we look at the suspension layout. So cycle carts normally use rigid axles. The front has a beam axle and leaf springs, and the rear a rigid drive axle like a go-kart. At the rear, for simplicity, we will stick with the norm. A continuous axle with two inboard pillow block bearings and lateral restraint via the lock screws on the inner bearing race. It does make the rear axle of the car dominate the dynamics, but we'll get to that later. For the front, however, I want to keep the look of the Lotus and have an independent front end, rocker and spring damper set up. It does allow for geometry adjustment and we have a heap of experience designing and building these front ends. Keeping the steering effort low is a key objective and the double wishbone setup will aid in achieving that. The spring damper setup is great as they're lightweight, spring rates can be quickly adjusted and they have efficient damping. The leaf springs that suit these cards can also be hard to come by in Australia. They're also heavy and they're just not my cup of tea. So before I go on, please note that this picture is for illustration only. I'm not trying to hate on the creator of this cart as a super cool or hate on beam axles as they have their place. This is a personal decision we've made and it is open to interpretation. So beam axles can be made to work, but there are several compromises with respect to the dynamic wheel geometry and steering effort. Adjustability is a main goal and the knuckle designs on these cars are essentially set and forget. You can do something like a go-kart kingpin, but because of the tall wheels, its adjustment is limited. Secondly, for low steering effort, this design inherently has a large scrub radius, which is a leading cause of large steering efforts. So a fun fact, in pre-war cars which had these setups, they added positive camber, so it would move the contact patch closer to the kingpin intersection, which reduced the scrub radius and made them easier to steer. At this point, we think it's important to elaborate on the outboard suspension geometry fundamentals. Apologies if you already know this, but hopefully it will be useful to some. There are five aspects of the steering to consider. Contact patch, caster angle or rake, trail or mechanical trail or caster offset, kingpin inclination or steering axis inclination, and finally scrub radius or offset. It is common for these terms to be interchanged and there is widespread confusion around what the effects of these parameters as there are a heap of coupled effects. The first definition is for the contact patch. The contact patch is the area of the tyre that contacts the road. If you took a cut through the tyre where it touches the road, it would be either rectangular or square depending on the tyre. In free body diagrams, we represent it as a single point at the geometric centre of the patch. It's also worth noting that we assume rigid bodies and no tire distortion in the explanations below. In reality, nothing is 100% rigid and the contact patch is a piece of rubber and will move a lot. Next, we look at caster, which I think is probably the most misunderstood and we'd say it's because of caster wheels causing this confusion. So caster is defined as the angle the steering axis makes with the vertical when viewed from the side of the car. So first, we draw a line through the ball joints. Then we add a vertical line from the contact patch. The angle between this line and our steering axis is our caster angle. To understand the dynamic effect of caster, we will use some very high-tech graphics. We will only consider the geometric effect to the wheel and tire assemblies, 
no force effects just yet. So for these examples, it is useful to look at what happens in extreme cases. Because the steering axis is tilted, we end up with a camber change when the wheel is steered. We set the wheel to zero camber when no steering lock is applied. Then we turn the outside wheel 90 degrees into a right hand corner. We see the wheel has cambered so that the inside of the tire is close to the ground, negative camber. Also note that the wheel has lifted off the ground. Now let's look at what happens when we turn the front wheels 90 degrees into a left handed corner. We see that the outside of the tire has pushed more into the ground, more positive camber. And also the whole wheel has been pushed into the road more too. So what does this mean? Caster adds positive camber to the inside wheel and negative camber to the outside wheel. And that caster lifts the outside wheel off the ground and pushes the inside wheel into the ground. The lifting or lowering does create self-centering effects as the car wants to return to equilibrium and consequentially this increases the steering effort as you are physically lifting the car through the steering wheel itself. So now we've looked at the geometric effect of caster. We will next move on to mechanical trail, which is the force effect. This is also a consequence of caster angle. Trail is a measure of how the contact patch trails the steering axis. It has two main effects, self-centering and feedback to the driver. So before we elaborate on its effects, let's geometrically define trail. We start with the axis drawn for caster. Then we extend the steering axis to intersect with the ground. It meets at a point forward of the center of the contact patch. The distance between the steering axis intersection point and the contact patch is the trail length. For self-centering, imagine you are in a turn. The wheels have lock and there is a lateral force which is required to turn the corner. This lateral force creates a moment about the steering axis. Now, if you let go of the steering wheel, it will try to return to center. With reduced steering angle, it inherently decreases the lateral load and stops turning until the lateral force is zero and the wheels are back straight. So during cornering, the only thing that resists the steering wheel from turning back to straight is the driver. So all that moment is reacted back into the steering wheel. So given this fact, for a fixed trail length, the moment and therefore the force into the steering wheel back to the driver will also vary with the magnitude of lateral force. This phenomenon is considered a key part of the driver feedback loop. You will feel the steering wheel force increase as your grip increases, but will also be able to feel loss of grip slightly before the car will change its attitude. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's add the tie rod to the system and then start to gradually increase lock and consequently lateral grip. Small lateral force for a fixed trail length equates to a small moment and consequently a small steering force. Increasing lateral grip means more force back into the tie rod and the steering wheel. Now, let's say we hit peak force of the tires and you're working hard to keep the wheel turned. What happens if you turn maybe just a bit too much and lose a little bit of lateral force, but you are still wrenching on the steering to resist the force needed before the loss of grip? The steering will feel lighter so the system is telling you that you are pushing too hard. And this is where feedback from trail is so critical. Great drivers know how to ride the edge of the tire's grip based on this kind of feedback. So to summarize, trail gives self-centering force and feedback. The steering moment increases proportionally to the increased force or trail length. More moment equates to more feedback into the steering wheel. But it's also a balance too much and you lose feel and the steering becomes too heavy or too little and you lose this feedback. Finally, just as a side note, the distance from the tie rod to the steering axis will also change the force back into the steering wheel, but it's not usually a tool you can play with for Ackerman reasons. Next, we look at kingpin inclination, KPI or steering axis inclination, SAI. It's defined as the angle the steering axis makes with the vertical when viewed from the front of the car. As before, we draw a line through the ball joints. The angle between this line and the vertical line from the contact patch is our kingpin inclination angle. It is normally used to minimize our scrub radius, but 
it also has similar effects on camber and ride height like caster. So we will look at these effects first. It is also important to note that KPI is a different thing to camber angle. To show the effect on camber angle, as before, we'll use an extreme case and set the KPI the same as the static camber, i.e. axle at right angles to steering axis with zero caster. Note that we are starting with negative camber where the inside of the tire is closer to the ground. If we turn the front wheel 90 degrees as if the car is entering a right hand corner, the axle loses its angle from horizontal. Therefore, the wheel must be sitting flat on the ground. We have gone from negative camber to zero camber, essentially positive camber gain. Now, let's go the other way. Due to side view symmetry, we find that we have the same positive camber gain on both inside and outside wheels. We have gone from negative camber to zero camber. Finally, we look at the change in height of the wheel. KPI pushes the wheel into the ground either side of zero steer angle. In effect, KPI gives another self-centering effect to the steering due to the fact that it lifts the car off the ground for any steering input. So we have looked at the geometric effect of KPI. Now we look at scrub radius. This looks at the force effects and is a consequence of KPI. Scrub radius is the arc by which the outside wheel is pushed forward in a turn and the inside wheel moves backwards in a turn. It is another feedback and dynamic wheel angle mechanism. So before we go into effects, let's geometrically define scrub. We start with the axis drawn for KPI. We then extend the steering axis to intersect with the ground. It meets at a point offset from the contact patch and the distance between the two is the scrub radius. As with trail, if you apply a force at the contact patch, it'll create a moment about the steering axis. This occurs in straight line modes, braking, drive, if a front wheel drive or all wheel drive car, and tire drag. If you have positive scrub, where the intersection is on the inside half of the tire, it'll create toe in under braking. And conversely, under drive, it'll create a toe out moment. On front wheel drive road cars, this causes torque steer. It is another means by which feedback comes into the steering, as with trail. With increased grip in either direction, it will create a force into the steering wheel so the driver can feel the grip levels. The final part of this explanation is the effect that scrub radius had when a bump load is applied and the implication on steering effort. Now imagine a car with zero caster angle and a large scrub radius. When a vertical force is applied, a moment is created at the base of the steering axis. This moment is then fully resolved into the wishbones as tension compression forces. No moment is created about the steering axis, therefore, no force is transmitted back into the steering wheel. Now, imagine the extreme case of a 90 degree caster angle and a large scrub radius. The moment created is completely resolved as a rotation about the steering axis. So if you hit a bump and didn't want the wheel to change camber angle, the driver would have to resist that load through the steering wheel. Now, this is an exaggerated case. However, large scrub radius coupled with caster angles above zero degrees will increase the steering effort on any road surface rougher than a billiard table. And if you've ever driven a car without power assistance or heavy steering, it's not nice. So what do we do? Well, given that KPI acts symmetrically and scrub radius increases steering effort in bump, braking and cornering, we generally try to minimize the scrub radius and it's always at the expense of KPI. KPI generally lands where it does based on setting your scrub radius such that it isn't excessive. Scrub and KPI are also affected by packaging considerations that can compromise the setup, such as wheel offsets, tire width and diameter, tire grip potential and suspension type, so you don't always get a perfect outcome. Finally, KPI and caster can offset each other for dynamic wheel camber. KPI is a positive camber gain and caster is a negative camber gain on the outside wheel and positive camber gain on the inside wheel. So setting the right angles in conjunction with virtual swing arm lengths can ensure that camber is always negative to offset tire sidewall distortion. Whew. All right, 
So hopefully this has explained reasonably well the isolated effects of the steering geometry on steering effort, feedback and camber control. There are more combined scenarios, but I don't want to bore you any more in this video, which has already grown arms and legs. I will also note that without tire data at different speeds, loads, slip angles, slip rates, etc., you're essentially guessing. But sometimes you can build in enough adjustment and luck into something that works. There is a lot more vehicle dynamics I can cover with respect to tires, camber, roll centers, weight transfer, downforce, etc which I can do another video if there's interest. So in selecting the double wishbone, it allows me a more flexible arrangement in setting and adjusting these parameters compared with just the regular knuckle, hence why we went in this direction. We now move into the steering layout. The front end packaging is very tight, so the positioning of the steering rack and column configuration will have a big effect on the design and driving experience. There are two main steering positions, front steer, where the tie rod is in front of the steering axis, and rear steer, for the tie rod behind the steering axis. For front steer, it is easier for packaging as it puts the rack in a spot behind the pedals and you can use the front bulkhead for mounting. It also allows for low column and UJ angles. It is more difficult to get large Ackerman ratios as you have to push the mounting point on the upright into the wheel and usually there is no room. Depending on the packaging, front steer can create an angle on the tie rod and pushes the misalignment of the spherical at the rack end to its maximum, potentially leading to bind. For rear steer, it allows shorter steering columns. It's also easier to get large Ackerman ratios as you move the upright tie rod pickup point into the car, for which there is large clearance. However, to avoid bump steer, the tie rod needs to track the same arc as your wishbone to avoid changes in length due to the angle geometry. To do this, you essentially have to have it in line with either the top or bottom wishbone points. If you put your steering tie rod high, the position of the rack needs to be in the middle of the footwell, so it essentially becomes a shin breaker. Also, depending on the geometry, the steering lever arm can be messy. If you do a low mounted rack, you need extreme UJ angles, possibly even compound UJs for a 90 degree bevel box, which is super complex, expensive, and totally unnecessary. So we have selected front steer. We need to pay attention to the tie rod angles and rates during the detailed design phase. Righto, we've gotten to the end of the first part of this design series. To summarize, we went through a brief concept select phase in which we selected the objectives, wheelbase, track width, the driver position. We picked a mid-engine layout with front steer, a double wishbone front suspension, and a solid rear axle. In the next two videos, we'll get into the detailed design phase. So we hope you've enjoyed this first part don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions, shoot us one in the comments or DM us on Instagram and Facebook at Team Uich. Until next time, hooroo!